What's going on everyone, Scott here. Welcome back to the channel. Michigan State versus Purdue, 8 p.m. Saturday night on Fox at Purdue in Mackey Arena. Uh, a tough place for Michigan State to play in recent memory. A tough place for most people today to play, but another primetime game and another huge opportunity for Michigan State to help get on the right side of the NCAA tournament to extend that streak. Now, Purdue, obviously, we know who they are. Similar story to last year, number two in the country, 25-3 and three overall, 14-3 and three overall in the conference. Zach Eady, once again, looking like he is more than likely going to win back-to-back -back National Player of the Year awards, averaging 24, 12, and two blocks a game. But in my opinion, I think the evolution, you know what you're going to get of Zach Eady. The evolution of Braden Smith, though, he has seen a jump in every important statistical category from last year up to 13, 7, and 6 with two steals as well as shooting 46% and 42% from three while also clipping at 83% from the free throw line. He has arguably been the second most important player on this team besides Zach Eady, obviously. Being able to control the game in all facets has really, I think, boosted Purdue to them being even better than they were last year. Lance Jones is a senior guard who has been around the program now for five years, and he's a steady offensive threat for them. And one of their better three-point shooters, shooting 40% from three. Now, Fletcher Lawyer, obviously Foster's brother, has seen a small decrease in points per game and assists, but his three-point percentage has shot quite a bit up, seen quite an increase in that, going from 33% last year to 41% this year. He is someone, of course, who went off against Michigan State last year at the Breslin Center, scoring 17 points and most of those in the second half and down the stretch. I believe at Purdue, when Michigan State played there, I believe he only had about nine points as well, but I, I, I'd watch for him to go off again or have a decent game for Purdue. Overall, offensively, it is very tough to stop Purdue. They are top 10 in scoring at 85 a game, top three in three-point percentage, uh, being the number one team in adjusted offensive efficiency, according to Bart Torvik, as well as top 15 in, festive, in effective, field goal, effective field goal percentage, offensive rating percentage, and free throw rate percentage, and also being the fifth best block percentage team in the country. Obviously, a whole bunch of that obviously has to do with with Zach Eady down there. Defensively, they don't force a lot of turnovers, but they do give up the ball around 12 times a game. So that's something to keep an eye on, especially since Michigan State has been really good at turning teams over this year, and they've been pretty good. One of the better Michigan State teams in recent memory, or maybe my whole memory of Michigan State fandom at not turning the ball over. So that is definitely a key to the game. See how they can force Purdue out of into some comfortable spots, you know, possibly get some turnovers. And, you know, biggest thing is trying to get out in transition. If we can get out in transition and, you know, keep Edie behind the play, then I think that'll help MSU a lot. And that starts with, you know, taking advantage of them turning it over about 12 times a game and holding onto the ball yourself. Now for MSU, obviously, you're probably not going to be able to get downhill, as we said, and score in the paint most of the game due to the pure presence of Edie down there. I know Izzo said when he appeared on uh, Big Ten Today this week, that they, you know, they were using like broomsticks and stuff, different stuff in practice to try to emulate, you know, Edie down there. But you're probably not going to, in your regular half-court set, be able to get downhill like that. So, like we say every game, as I just mentioned, if you can get out on the break, then I think that's the main way you're going to be able to get to the paint in, you know, Zach Edie minutes. If Zach Edie's off the court, then obviously you can do some different things and possibly get downhill to the paint. But still one of the slower teams in the country in terms of, getting out on the break, which is an insane thing to say as an MSU fan or someone who has watched this team the last 28, 29 years or so. I'm all for Tom's usual strategy against these gigantic humans that Purdue usually has. This is dating back to 2016, 17, somewhere in there with Harms and you know some of the other guys they've had down there, seven plus feet down there. Usually they let them get theirs, you know, 30 and 15, or I think he even got 38, I believe it was, at Mackey last year. And then just trying to slow down or, you know, shut the water off of everyone else, and specifically the three-point shooting line. Although you will see Michigan State sometimes double off of certain people, certain people that they're, you know, okay with leaving at the three-point line, so that, you know, probably, obviously won't be 
foster lawyer that won't be Lance Jones. If I had to guess, they'll probably, if first is on the floor, they'll probably float off him. Ethan Morton, they'll probably float off him. If, if either of them are on the floor, I think that's a plus for Michigan State. They'll be able to, you know, kind of float off of them. Everyone else shoots it high 30s into the 40s for guys that, you know, shoot it, you know, more than Zach Eady. I, I don't know. I think he has like two threes on the season attempted. Yeah, he's one for two on the season. So obviously, you know, he's not a guy that, you know, shoots a lot, but for guys that do, you know, shoot more, most of them are above 40% or high 30s. So for Michigan State, you know, to win this game, you're going to have to hit some threes. And, you know, since the rough start to the year, Michigan State has, you know, been, I believe, top 50 in the country in three-point percentage. But you're going to need some threes to try to help take the crowd out of it. You know, especially when Edie's in the game, if he's getting, you know, easy or even contested twos down low, you just try to make those twos as contested as possible. But if the crowd's into it and you're offense isn't going, you're a stagnant offense, you're, you know, under eight, then it's just AJ or Tyson or Jaden, someone trying to just go one-on-one -on -one to the basket and, you know, you're missing shots, then this game could get out of hand. So you got to hit some shots early on, try to maybe give yourself a little bit of a cushion before they get rolling. But also, this is one of the toughest places to play in the conference, and MSU hasn't won at Mackey since the 2013-2014 season. But this game, I believe, will be decided by our guards and wings. Obviously, mainly the four main players, AJ, Tyson, Jaden, specifically. Malik, I won't include in this, but obviously he's part of the four that, you know, will, I think he'll need a good game for Michigan State to walk in there and get this win. But specifically those three, I circle, because if they don't get the scoring going, both from the three-point arc and getting your stuff going away from Edie, then you got little to no chance to get anything done, arguably against the best team in the country. You know, Malik, I think will have his opportunities to, you know, have another solid game. He's been 15 plus for, I, I don't know off the top of my head how many, he's been 15 plus for quite a while now in his average, and he's having a tremendous second half of his senior season. So, you know, we'll need that for him and him, but I think the guards and wings in AJ Tyson and Jaden, I think big emphasis on specifically those three. Seems like we know what we're getting from Malik most nights now who's, you know, he's someone who's struggled with consistency throughout his career. But thankfully, the second half of his senior season, besides one stinker early in January, he's been really consistent. So you got to get those guys going. Now, I would enjoy to see some small ball here, which we've barely seen this year. And I sound like a broken record because I think I've mentioned this on a handful of these previews or postgame shows. I think that this is something that Izzo used in the tournament last year that was successful. Now, trying to use small ball when Edie's out there and bringing Edie out of the paint. Now, I'm assuming, depending on who they have out there, like especially if they have Cohen Carr out there, they know he's not a three-point shooter. They'll probably try to sag Edie off of him. If he does go out to the paint, they'll sag him off anyway, so he still can have that rim presence. But if you can find any way to, if you have Book out there, I would like to see Book and, you know, maybe Book play the five, Edie's on him. That way you have Hall out there as well. And then, you know, you can run a lot of pop action, you know, pick and pop action for Booker. See if you can get him out of the paint. See if you can get some back doors, you know, opposite side to try to force the issue at the basket and not just relying on the three-point arc. But you are going to, in my opinion, you're going to have to hit some, you know, major threes to keep the crowd out of it and stay um, in this game you know, especially early on while Edie's in there. But I would I would like to see some Cohen and Malik at the four and five as well, you know, possibly when, when Edie's out of there, you know, because as I just mentioned about Cohen, that's the defensive coverages they could use. So I don't think it'll be as advantageous to run that lineup while he is in there. That being said, I do think Tom will go heavy with, you know, Maddie Sissoko and Coop, mainly trying to just wall up Edie the best they can. Obviously, that's your two biggest guys, but I would like to see the length of Book on him, see if it has any effect. Obviously, he's still giving up a few inches on the wingspan-wise, but we'll like to see a little bit different look, just try to make him as uncomfortable as possible on the offensive end, but he'll still get his, but, you know, specifically also on the defensive end, try to make him, you know, as uncomfortable as possible and try to make him do, you know, stuff that he's maybe not used to doing every game. But also for MSU, this is your last chance at a quad one win in the regular season, that is. If you win a couple games in the Big Ten tourney and you face these guys or Illinois again, that might be another shot. But 
we're almost at the end of the line for the regular season and you need to still win another game or two at least to feel good on Selection Sunday about extending that tournament streak. As of right now, I believe Michigan State is still in around a nine seed. I think most you know publications have them at right now. Obviously, would like to try to improve that as best as you can. But the next two games are not e easy either after this. You got Northwestern at home, and we know how they've had MSU's number recently. And then in Bloomington for their senior night, which obviously Indiana hasn't played great this year. But their senior night at home, Bloomington's always a tough place to play. So neither of those are a shoe in that you can win this game, even though you're favored by, I think, at least five in each of those games. Now, Bart Torvik has this as an 11-point Purdue win. Especially in, Mac in Mackey, I'm surprised that it's only 11 as MSU has gotten boat raced there a handful of times. But looking back at the schedule, I do see like 15. There's been some, you know, within 10 point games, but then there's, you know, a couple. Uh, I believe it was 2019 where you got boat raced by like 30 at Mackey. So, but I think that says something about this team because I think MSU could walk into that re arena and win a game. They have no business in winning on the grounds of what we've seen so far this season. Obviously, going into the season, we predicted, you know, MSU and Purdue were the top two teams, and then it was everyone else. That hasn't panned out this year. Obviously, Purdue's held up there under the bargain, but Michigan State has not, obviously, as we've talked about ad nauseum. And we have no business to expect that, especially after the last two games. However, when the four main guys, AJ, Tyson, Jaden, and Malik, get it all going, especially at the same time, and the center position spot is just doing serviceable things that don't shoot this team in the foot. You know, you know, walling up ED, walling up whatever center's out there, you know, grabbing rebounds, not turning the ball over, you know, catching the ball and, you know, you know, flipping it over, reversing, whatever their job is on that particular possession. They can still beat anyone in the country. That's what the numbers show. That's what the metrics show. And that's what your eyeballs show. That you might not think that given how this team has played, you know, over the course of the season and especially after the stink after the last two uh, games, the two home losses last week that were really bad when you were about double digit favorites almost in both games. But that team is still in there. Will, will it come out? Who knows? They could go in there and they could lose by 30 as much as I can see them squeaking away a four point win or a, you know, a three, four point loss. So, you know, really anything's a go. I don't have a huge pulse on, you know, who's going to win this game. Obviously, the easy choice is, you know, ESPN right here, you know, 86% Purdue, 14% Michigan State. Obviously, Purdue's the number two team in the country. Michigan State's not ranked, struggling to secure a spot in the NCAA tournament. But can still, it's still in there. They could still go in there and win this game. Now, am I predicting that? No. But you're telling me there's a chance? Maybe a little bit. Just a little bit. However, it is, as much as we were frustrated with Tom Izzo last week, one, he's still a legend. But yes, you are able to criticize him. But two, recording this March 1st, games on March 2nd, he's not called Mr. March for no reason. He's done stuff like this before. This time of the year, winning time, regular season, tournament time. The team needs a big win. You can bet he's going to have the team ready to go. Now, I say I don't really know what happens. I could see them walking in there and losing by 30. Yes, that could happen, but I think that's mainly because of how good Purdue is. But if I had to bet money on it, I think this is going to be a closer game than, than even what the numbers say. As we said, what, Purdue's an 11-point favorite. I think it's going to be even closer than that. I think it's going to be within, you know, five to seven points for most of the game. And I think it's going to continue to tip back and forth. Can MSU keep it like that and close it out the last four minutes of the game? We'll see. But I'm looking forward to find out what is in this team responding after a tough week and I believe it was on you know the Spiro Avenue show they were on I believe I saw a quote from Coop who was on there with Malik this past week I believe he said we might have got a little bit complacent so they're excited to get back out there I'm excited after six days off to see what this team has in them do they have it to 
go out there, get a win. They shouldn't against the number two team in the country and, you know, really turn the perception back to where we were going into last week, having won three in a row, you know, four or five, eight of ten. Can you get the expectations back on that route? If you get this win, obviously you steal up an NCAA tournament bid. No questions about it. If you keep it close, then you know you still need to win a game or two going forward. But that'll do it. Let's hope the boys can go in there, get a win. And thank you all so much for watching. Go Green. Peace out.